National conventions of Democrats and Republicans are now finished. The two events were similar in that they aimed to su attract support from their own bases. But the conventions differed in important ways, in format, style and content. Our reporter Kevin Hogan brings us a side-by-side -side comparison. The pandemic caused both Democrats and Republicans to make adjustments to their conventions this year. The DNC was mostly virtual, with only a few events featuring small in-person gatherings. Yet the RNC had a mixture of live and taped events with speeches at the Andrew W. Mellon Auditorium in Washington, D.C., and gatherings of delegates in Charlotte, North Carolina. The RNC culminated in Trump's acceptance speech at the White House in front of over a thousand people, an event which health officials criticized. Both candidates addressed the impact the pandemic is having on the U.S. Joe Biden was dissatisfied with the number of cases and deaths. Five million Americans infected by COVID-19. More than 170,000 Americans have died. By far the worst performance of any nation on earth. Obama praised Biden's response to past health outbreaks, and he's confident Biden will handle the challenges posed by the current pandemic well. They will get this pandemic under control, like Joe did when he helped me manage H1N1 and prevent an Ebola outbreak from reaching our shores. President Trump stood behind his decisions and looked forward to a promising future. Not a single American who has needed a ventilator has been denied a ventilator, which is a miracle. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together, we will crush the virus. The DNC this year was more religious than usual, but omitted the words under God from the Pledge of Allegiance at least twice, while Republicans affirmed their faith in God. In America, we don't turn to government to restore our souls. We put our faith in Almighty God. The RNC kicked off with a prayer from Cardinal Timothy Dolan. At the DNC, Father Jim Martin prayed that we open our hearts to those most in need, including unborn children in the womb. By contrast, Democratic nominee Biden plans to restore funding for Planned Parenthood, which performed over 300,000 abortions last year. The RNC featured a pro-life activist and a resolute pro-life stance from President Trump. That all children, born and unborn, have a God-given right to life. One notable difference between the two conventions was how vocal each were on China. The DNC headliners did not make much mention of China apart from Biden's single statement. We will never again be at the mercy of China or other foreign countries in order to protect our own people. Yet at the RNC, headliners voiced strong stances on an increasingly aggressive and reckless Chinese regime. Senator Blackburn held them accountable for covering up the virus outbreak. Proud. The medical researchers developing a vaccine and therapies to combat what the Chinese Communist regime unleashed on the world. And a human rights lawyer who escaped persecution by the Chinese Communist Party advocating for Trump's re-election. The CCP is an enemy of humanity. We need to support, vote, and fight for President Trump for the sake of the world. In just over two months, the American people will elect the new leader of the free world. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. After Trump's official nomination, multiple attendees were harassed and followed by protesters just outside of the White House. Senator Rand Paul was even followed and shouted at all the way into his lobby of his hotel. This video shows the aftermath of the Republican National Convention. Protesters swarming around and screaming at people as police tried to protect them. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul was one target. A group of people gathered around and yelled at him, ordering him to acknowledge the killing of Breonna Taylor, a resident in his state who was killed by police after they came into her home under the authority of a no-knock warrant. It's unknown whether the protesters were aware or not that following Taylor's unlawful killing, Senator Rand was the one who introduced the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act. The act calls to prohibit police from using no-knock warrants which is what led to Taylor's death in March of this year. Despite the work he's done around criminal justice reform, the crowd of protesters still insisted on ordering him to say her name, even following him all the way to the lobby of his hotel. Rand Paul told Fox News that he also heard threats of violence and even death threats. Lawmakers could cut NYPD officers some slack if they vote to tweak the city's controversial chokehold law. Right now, officers face criminal charges if they compress a suspect's diaphragm during an arrest, whether they meant to or not. 
NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the council's proposal. History. When Mayor Bill de Blasio signed the chokehold bill into law about a month ago, he said concerns were raised about the diaphragm portion of the law. But he signed it anyway, saying he thought it could work. Now he and city council are thinking of making some changes. I think there have been honest questions and concerns about what police officers can and cannot do, and we need our police officers to have clear instruction. Right now, NYPD officers face criminal charges for using chokeholds, but also for sitting, kneeling, or standing on a person in a way that compresses the diaphragm. As we speak, police unions are suing the city over the law, which they say threatens officers for doing their jobs in good faith. The proposed amendment would make it so only people compressing the diaphragm recklessly would face charges. The founder of Blue Lives Matter NYC says lawmakers are trying to recover from what he calls their bad decision. We should not wait till months later to want to amend a bill that could potentially save lives. It's it's they're they're shamed right now behind closed doors they're going to try any stop they can to try to reverse what they cost we contacted the mayor for comment but he didn't get back to us immediately miguel moreno ntd news new york as tensions rise around law enforcement one ex-convict turned ceo and activist spends his time building relationships between police and prisoners John Ponder, founder of Hope for Prisoners, tells us how he went from hating cops to, in his words, helping prisoners develop respect and love for the laws of the land. Ponder's life is a testimony to transformation. He's spent 20 years in and out of jails and ultimately taken to federal prison for bank robbery. Once hating law enforcement officers, Ponder tells us he later realized the root of that animosity. You know, I had taken an inventory of all the enemies that were laying dormant on the enemy, and I had come up with a list of 47 of them. You know, 47 enemies living on the enemy, and I'm spending a lifetime fighting enemies on the outside. And I think that that's a principle that we all, as humans, um, could wrap our minds around that. And I think that if we did that, um, you know, the, the things that we are seeing in the war right now, you know, we, begin, we can begin to see people as the people that they are. While facing a possible 23-year prison sentence, he made a vow to never go back. After handing his life over to the creator, Ponder was only sentenced to five years. And just this week, fully pardoned by the President of the United States. You know that, Jamie. You know, tears started rolling down out of my face. I was immediately reminded of, um, you know, when I first began my last prison sentence, I had surrendered my life to the Lord. So in that moment, God had reminded me that he pardoned me many years ago for, you know, for everything from my past. In the last 10 years since John was released, he has created one of the most successful reentry programs Hope for prisoners in Las Vegas. Ponder's program helps prisoners develop respect for law and order and teaches both the convicts and the officers that they have more in common than they have differences. So far, Hope for Prisoners has helped more than 3,000 former prisoners get integrated back into the community. A crucial piece to the puzzle, Ponder tells us, is the Family Foundation. We work to make sure there's a mechanism in place to help with that family reunification component because if that piece is not right, if the home life is not right, then everything else in the world has the tendency to fall apart. That's why he and his team take to the prisons to help guide people and help them find the best in themselves again. I have family and it's like my parents, they do their own thing. They're not worried about what I'm doing. So it's different to have somebody that actually wants to see good come up out of you. From my own personal experience, is that the majority of people, they really want to change. They have no idea how to do it. Hope for Prisoners has shown to be overwhelmingly successful. 94% of people who joined the program have not been back behind bars. Ponder has a plan to expand his program across the nation. And he says he truly believes that in the midst of the unrest we're seeing today, this is something that can help heal our land. Melina Weiskopf, NTD News.